Greetings, you all. My name is Justin. I'm the host of Inverse, and we are so happy to see each one of you who are with us through podcast or through video. Uh, in the studio, we have Kali and Siku and Sebastian. Hello. Hey. Hello. Hon. Greetings, y'all. Hey. Great. Yeah, you guys like that intro? Greetings, Earthlings. Like, <laughs> all right. I was. That's a, that's that's cool. Uh, let's go to Leviticus <laughs> chapter three. Leviticus chapter three. Uh, we're going from aliens to the southern accent to Leviticus. Chapter 3. Uh, we want to say that we are studying the book of Leviticus, and we're so happy that you're with us. Uh, we have been covering chapter 1 and chapter 2 last week, and Leviticus is not the easiest book. So I encourage you to go to inversebible.org and look at the Bible study guide entitled Leviticus. It's the third book of the Bible, and it should be the most up to date uh, Bible study guide, depending on when you're watching this episode or listening to this episode. Um, we're going to pray and read the Bible and then study. That's what we do here on Inverse. You guys ready? Mm -hmm. All right, yes, sir. let's get to it. Callie, if you can pray for us. Absolutely. Father in heaven, we are grateful so much for your presence here with us, and we're grateful for the gift of your word. I pray that you would open our eyes, that we may behold wondrous things from your word, and that you would help us to see Jesus, that you'd help us to understand the details, and that we would enjoy this time together, that you would take any distractions from us, but we would really see um, what you're trying to teach us today and how this applies to us um, today and every day from now. We ask and pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Uh, Sebastian, let's go to chapter 3 of Leviticus. This mm -hmm. Leviticus is the third book of the Bible, and then chapter 3 is the third chapter of Leviticus. And we'll read from verse 3, or verse 1. Okay. <laughs> verse 1. When his offering is a sacrifice of a peace offering, if he offers it of the herd, whether male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand on the head of his offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood all around on the altar. Then he shall offer from the sacrifice of the peace offering an offering made by fire to the Lord. The fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails the two kidneys and the fat that is on them by the flanks and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys, he shall remove. And Aaron's sons shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is on the wood that is on the fire as an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. Okay, let's pick up verse six. Uh, Siku, can you read for verse six? Sure. If he's offering as a sacrifice if his offering as a sacrifice of a peace offering to the Lord is of the flock, whether male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. If he offers a lamb as his offering, then he shall offer it before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand on the head of his offering and kill it before the tabernacle of meeting. And Aaron's sons shall sprinkle its blood all around on the altar. Then he shall offer from the sacrifice of the peace offering as an offering made by fire to the Lord, its fat and the whole fat tail, which he shall remove close to the backbone, and the fat that covers the entrails, and all the fat that is on the entrails, the two kidneys and the fat that is on them by the flanks, and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys he shall remove, and the priest shall burn them on the altar as food, an offering made by fire to the Lord. And then Kelly from verse 12 to verse 17. And if his offering is a goat, then he shall offer it before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on its head and kill it before the tabernacle of meeting. And the sons of Aaron shall sprinkle its blood all around on the altar. Then he shall offer from it his offering as an offering made by fire to the Lord. The fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails. The two kidneys and the fat that is on them by the flanks and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys he shall remove. And the priest shall burn them on the altar as food an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma. All the fat is the Lord's. This shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations in all your dwellings. You shall eat neither fat nor blood. All right, so we just read all of chapter three, and this is like one of those chapters like, what? There's fat, <laughs> there's kidneys, there's tails of fat, fatty there's lobes. backbone, oh, fatty lo lobes. I, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's got all what you need in a good chapter of the Bible. <laughs> um, Critical. It's not one of those chapters that you share with someone on a hospital bed. 
right? No. It's not when no, you, you want to encourage someone, it. you know, and we're like, hey, let's go to Leviticus 3 and let's, <laughs> let's read about. But uh, we, we, we shan't be so, I use the word shan't. I, that's, ooh. Uh, ooh, it's, yeah. all right. It'd be so Fancy. arrogant as to say, hey, but this is not applicable to my life. This is not a uh, part of the Bible. I guess, I guess every, every episode we have, and especially in the book of Leviticus, we have to emphasize that. It's a difficult book. It's a, it's a gory book. It's a visual book. It's also a, a olfactory aroma book, as mm -hmm. we, we talked about last week. What is going on here, Siku? <laughs> They're offering. They're offering. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Very good. So yeah. we're in a trajectory just They're to give you more context. Yeah. And I, that, was, that wasn't a fair question. Uh, and I like to do that. And you guys like to give me weird responses in response. Uh, there's there's five five offerings. And then oh, the first sorry. one. What, what are we doing from the beginning? Yeah. Like, no, 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 no. no. Okay. The first one is totally all about it's been burnt, mm -hmm. I meaning going yes. all out. Second one, it's like a recipe. And it's about, hey, giving to God. Right, no death, but just giving. Mm -hmm. The third one here. Um, what are what, what, we're going to do this together? What, what's going on this third one? Well, the first thing you see is the um, similar to the first offering, right? You lay your hand in verse two. Yep. On the head of the offering, and then you kill it at the door of the tabernacle. So yep. that's very similar, right, to represent the substitution element, right? Mm -hmm. This is taking your place. This is a transference you know, between the, the offerer and the offering itself. Mm -hmm. So it's building that similar connection, that substitutionary, and then taking the blood and sprinkling it all around, but there's no mention of it making atonement, mm -hmm. right? So this is kind of a unique offering, mm -hmm. but this isn't about a problem in your relationship with God. This is not about a conflict or wrath or a mistake, um, but this is actually about something else where it's like, oh, I'm offering this not because there's something wrong or I'm trying to be reconciled. I'm offering this in a sense of communion with God. Mm -hmm. So the goal here is, isn't about peace and assuaging guilt. This, this is really about enjoying peace mm -hmm. and giving that thanksgiving and, and mm -hmm. fellowshipping with God and with the priest and with each other, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, depending on your translation, some say peace offering, some say fellowship offering, mm -hmm. depending on which English you're using. Right. Uh, but you, so great points. There is, this is not an atonement offering per se. Uh, and then when you compare this, and I love Leviticus because like chapter one is like one offering, chapter two is another offering, chapter three is another. I mean, it's, it's very organized. Nice, it's organized. I just need it to be organized. True. And then later on, chapter seven, six and seven, it goes back through all these offerings, but it mentions from the priest's perspective. Right. So it's kind of a recap, but from the other side. Mm. Um, and then when you compare that with chapter seven and chapter three, that this offering was divided triway, right? Mm -hmm. So the fat stuff and the fatty tail and the fat and the fat, the fat, the fat, the fat all that <laughs> is burned, and that goes to God. The, the priest is given a certain portion of the animal, mm -hmm. and then the offerer is given a certain portion. So, whereas the first one, the first offering, you know, lamb is burned. <laughs> that was just in my weird cartoon. That was a great sound effect. Yeah? Absolutely. I mean, we got these cool things, why not use them? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's like a Foley, you should work for the industry. Uh, <laughs> and it's just like, man, I've sinned, and like, that could have been me, but Jesus, you became that for me, like, awesome. Second one is like, let me give, 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 give. This one is the three parties all come together and we're hanging out. Mm. And not to sound flippant, but I think hanging out or, or, or fellowshipping together is a, is a primordial uh, value of the universe. Mm -hmm. mm. Whereas God says, hey, let them build a sanctuary that I may dwell with them. Jesus came incarnated on the day he dwell. He could have done just more impersonal ways to save humanity. Absolutely. But he came to, I mean, hang out. That's not to downplay Jesus's motif, just to right. interact. and and enjoy our presence. And so God, priest, and sinner all coming together at the same table, and then again, eating together. Mm -hmm. mm. That's mm. powerful. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. And when, and when you think about the, 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 the element of Christ and that Christ being that offering facilitates that communion. Mm. He facilitates that fellowship. Mm. So as my substitute, yes, he, he died for me, and he gets rid of my guilt and my sin and my shame. And that's an important aspect of what Jesus represents to us mm -hmm. as our substitutionary atonement, to use a technical word. But then there's also this element that I think we just don't promote enough about Jesus being born of Mary 
in just that one birth, just that connection of humanity and divinity in him and the gap that he began to bridge between us and God mm -hmm. and to allow that fellowship to exist between us and God and then also ultimately between each other mm -hmm. and the constant unity that he was trying to bring and the healing that he was trying to bring between people themselves, even with the Gentiles, which started to come at the end of his ministry. So it's, I think it's an aspect of what the cross accomplishes, what Jesus' life accomplishes that we, we under preach and we do not present it and focus upon it enough, mm -hmm. which Leviticus is trying to draw attention to and say, hey, a whole chapter is dedicated to what Christ, you know, para, you know parabolically, I don't know if that's the right word, but as an illustration, a type of, <laughs> of, 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 what, oh, yeah, of, yeah. of what Jesus is bringing yeah. to the table. Yeah. And that's why, you know, the book of Leviticus should be appreciated for that. Yeah. And I, I, I was gonna Go say, I, I really, I, that's, that's powerful in that, um, what Christ has done for us is not just, yes, he wants to remove sin from us, from us, mm -hmm. but to what end, you know? So like when, when sin entered the universe, like this fellowship, this communion between mm -hmm. God and his creation was broken. And that's why Jesus came was to mm -hmm. restore that fellowship and to see the cross as just, you know, kind of forensic, like uh, just, it's just gonna take away my sins mm -hmm. kind of yes. thing. It, uh, this says the cross is more than that, right? It, mm. It's about restoring a relationship. And what I love, we didn't read the Leviticus 7 mm -hmm. part of it, but <laughs> you know, you described it, you know, aptly, but that there's the eating that is happening. You have this fellowship that is, you know, God with, with the, you know, the, the forgiven sinner, you mm -hmm. know, fellowshipping. You've got the priest in there who is like representing, you know, representing humanity to God. Like, so this, there's, there's this three-way fellowship that is happening. And in that I see, yes, there's that communion that we have with God that is restored because of what Christ has done. But even in our human relationships, because the meal is to be eaten by the yes. ones who are offering and you take it and you eat it with a group of people. So there's a fellowship that happens amongst ourselves, this, communion can be restored within humanity because of what Christ has done. Mm -hmm. yes. He bridges the relationships that are broken. Mm -hmm. His sacrifice brings peace, you know, in the relationship between father mm -hmm. and son, between mother and daughter, husband, and, um, wife. husband yeah. and wife. Like that is what Christ came to do was to like bridge those gaps and bring fellowship back. Yeah, I love that this is chapter three and that there's th is just three parties coming together. Mm -hmm. uh, I, all those relationships you mentioned, uh, if, if I can insert here, there are cultures that, that believe in like, hey, if two people can't get along, those people have to just get in a room and they have to resolve it. And it's, that's, it's very hard for two people. I mean, we're all, the four of us are, are married here. I mean, that's, we've all had marriage issues. I, that's, that's, a, that's probably the, the lows we have <laughs> in marriage is just two people s s feeling stuck there in a relationship and having no answer out. Yeah. Right? And yeah. then there's other cultures where like, if two people are having a problem, you just don't deal with it. You, you uh, lean on a third intercessor to come in, yeah. whether it's your mother-in-law or your father-in-law, which is kind of, isn't that a good scenario? <laughs> or it could be, you know, sometimes pastor or whatnot. Yeah. And in this case, it's, it's the Lord Jesus that comes interceding behind a holiness of, of divinity and the sinfulness of humanity and intersects those two. Yes. But in a marriage, like in a modern sense, we have a marriage counselor. We have, mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know, that, 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 that friend that both people can confide in coming in. And then Jesus is, because he's the master of that, he's creating a new kingdom of not people who are just peace doers, but peacemakers, mm -hmm. right? They are a, like a generation of intercessors out there. They're going mm -hmm. out and like, hmm, where are the two people that are like, mm -hmm. you know, healing marriages, healing families, healing churches, and those have been uh, disenfranchised by institutions yeah. and creating those bonds, right? I and, mean, that's the beauty of what we're getting at. And what the church should be in the world, right? Mm -hmm. When you look at the way society, I think we all will agree that division is becoming more and more marked, right, mm -hmm. in, in, in society now. And the recognition that that could be the fruit of that broken fellowship and the fact that we are, we, we connect sin with so many evil things in the world, but we don't necessarily directly connect it with that type of element of division. Mm -hmm. That why is it that we can't even sit down and talk when we disagree? Mm -hmm. Why is it that we cannot even have a dialogue about something that we both passionately disagree with going back to the marital thing. You know, the, the, the interesting thing is people are like, well, I just wanna be around people who only agree with my position. 
I want to be around people only see things the way I do. And I'm like, my wife and I don't see everything the same. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, you would never even get married mm -hmm. because she doesn't approach problems the same way I do. She doesn't approach parenting the way that I do or cleaning or cooking or planning a trip. Like you got to sit down and figure out, okay, how are we going to, you know, she's thinking about the kid's clothes and what their hair is going to look like, right? <laughs> you go out and I'm thinking like, well, do you have this? Cause people are going to be stressed out cause they ain't bring their like special bunny and now they're breaking down and you're trying to walk in the convention center for a meeting and she's not even thinking about it. But it's, it's, a, it's that unique combination of approaches and being able to maintain fellowship enough that we can benefit from each other's gifts and perspectives. And that's to me the power of that fellowship. And I think the, the, one of the powerful things here in, in Leviticus 3, I, I completely agree with you, like having a third party, disinterested party who mm. is interested in your welfare, mm. you know, um, interceding is, crucial. Um, one, one key thing that I see here in chapter three is the first thing that you take in this offering, the first part that you take is you take the fat and you give it to God. Mm. Like that's the first party that is involved in mm. this fellowship. Mm -hmm. And mm. for human relationships, like when God is acknowledged first, that facilitates the fellowship that can mm. happen within humanity. Just taking what Sebastian was saying, how we're so different. And I mean, you can be even from the same culture and yes. just your family culture is different, like in, within the same family. Like, yes. you know, so having, having a common focus on putting God first. Um, mm. And I don't know, for, for us growing up, like the fat was like the best part, like, you know, like, it, yeah, because it's sure. like the richest, you know, like it's got um, all the flavor. Yeah. And which I never understood. I never liked it. Oh, <laughs> like, okay. yeah, I, I didn't like it. But you're taking you take uh, the, the richest part of, you know, the sacrifice. Right. And you yeah. give it to God that that represents like putting God first, mm. like giving him not just first numerically, but giving him your best, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that mutual understanding of that's what goes first helps then now in the relationship between the parties mm -hmm. um, yeah. to resolve things if, if God is at the center. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. We see a lot of um, the church or Christianity should be the ones that brings people together, but often the accusation <laughs> is the church is the one that's causing the division yeah. or it's the Christians that are the ones. And then we live in, a, in an inverse world <laughs> where those who are not of, uh, of, of the church or of the Bible or religion, they're the ones that are uniting everyone. And they're the nice ones, but the ones in the Christians are the one with the, the pickets and the, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. the whatever. Um, any reactions to that? Callie, you're looking <laughs> at me. Oh, I don't. <laughs> no, okay. Siku, well, any? Okay, well, 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 Sebastian. Well, I, I think it's it's uh, interesting, right? You you ask you were you know pitching this thing to Callie because I think often about how similar and different Callie and I are, <laughs> and I think about when Callie and I really connect, it's a very deep connection, and when we're very different, it's very different, and the fact that you have that space in a relig as a religious person especially if the topic is religious, right? Or it is a value, a core value that you have. How do you manage that? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that in the, in the way that they see the division in the church, and it's like, well, why are these people the ones precipitating division and drawing the line? It's, there's a misstep in that process. Like, it's okay for you to be committed to your values and to be dug in on your position and where you are and how you feel about it. What is what is the step that is lost with Christ and what he illustrates in the blessed are the peacemakers that he's trying to promote is that those individuals are able to sit down and say, sometimes I got to take a loss. I got to take an L in order for this relationship to persist because I can never change your mind. If I destroy the relationship, I can never persuade you back this way. If I destroy the relationship so that it's like, I'm about being right rather than getting it right. But the goal is to get it right together. And I think that's the, the uniqueness that I see in, in relationships like I have with Callie, where you're like, okay, we're, we're divided. And if I get dogmatic about my position and she gets dogmatic about her position, we're, we're eventually going to be in that crossroad of either I'm going to preserve this relationship or I'm going to dig in and say, look, you know, to the, to the birds with this thing, I guess we're just not going to be friends. I guess we're just not going to hang out like, and that's just the way it is. 
And that's a hard place to be in because religiously, we're the ones that are supposed to say, I love you no matter what. Yeah. yeah. I, is that me? Yeah. 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 Jump in. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I think I, I agree with what Sebastian was saying. Um, I'm trying to think of like a really clear, like, this is why, this is the formula, Justin. This is why all these worldly people are godly. This is why all these religious people are ungodly. Um, I, don't have a <laughs> good, <Why>? yeah. <laughs> I don't have a good formula for you. Oh. But <laughs> I have a lot of anecdotes to be like, my experience backs up that sentence. Um, mm. I, I, I see a lot of spiritualization of bigotry, um, of this idea that as long as I, I don't know, like if I hold this viewpoint really intensely, that makes me godly. Yeah. And I'm like, I would love to see Jesus doing that. Um, I know your dad did and he was a pastor. I know your granddad did and he was a pastor, but <laughs> I would love to see an example of Jesus doing that. And so like even Jesus, when he was blasting the religious leaders, like, um, I remember I was listening to an audio book, uh, an audio, audio version of the Bible. And, you know, there's different versions and people, you know, we don't know what Jesus' voice sound, sounded like. But, you know, you hear a lot of like, woe to you. Da, da, da. And yes. there was one there where it was speaking of Jesus in the later chapters of Matthew. And they interpreted how Jesus was speaking instead more like, woe to you, Bethsaida. And because he was sad. Mm -hmm. He wasn't screaming at them. He was really sad, which matches a lot more with what he was saying, like how I would have longed to gather you mm -hmm. like as chicks under my wings. That's what I really want. <laughs> and then like, man, oh, like whitewashed sepulchers. I'm just so done with this. <laughs> and so for me, I, I see a lot of examples of people being like this because they're mimicking somebody that's not in scripture. Um, and there are people in the world who are mimicking people who are mimicking people in scripture. Mm. And so I have colleagues who aren't Christian. I have friends who are not Christians, but I, I ask them like who they look up to, who they admire. And if you follow it back a few, maybe like one, two levels, it's like that person was really godly. <laughs> and so it's like, it's interesting that the things that they value are true Christian godly values. Yeah but they just, they didn't see it in a church. And I'm like, well, fair enough. Mm. I, I didn't either. <laughs> I, the, I believe that what's missing is Jesus. Yeah. In why, you know, religious people can be so bigoted and mean spirited and just dig in your heels and like, I'm right no matter what and I don't care how you feel or whatever because we're lacking Jesus in this picture. This mm. chapter, chapter three began with Jesus. Like you're laying your hands on the sacrifice and it's pointing to Jesus. And the Bible tells us that he is our peace, mm -hmm. right? So if, if there is to be any peace that is broker, that is going to be lasting, it is going to be based on Jesus and the world everyone yearns for peace. Like we all have this desire and that's why the world yeah. like strives to bring about peace and you know, and you're nice, but you'll notice like even in that niceness, you, you have the people that you are nice to and the people that are out, you yeah. know, there's, there's there, in -group. yeah, you've got the in group that, that you're nice to and that you're fighting for, but everybody else, you're going to be very mean to them, you know? Yes. And ultimately the all, the real solution and the only solution as simplistic as it may be is <laughs> Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, and whether you're, there is no peace that the world can offer without Christ that is going to last. 100%. And there is no peace that the church can offer that is going to last without Jesus. Mm. Mm. So he's got, it has to be based on him and he has to be at the center of it. He's yeah. like, yeah. oh, and, and I was Go just ahead. gonna like, just to finish up on, on the thought of practicalizing it, mm -hmm. what, brings, what brings two people, what can bring two people together who are so completely different is if we have a mutual commitment to Christ then that is what breaks down those barriers is because it's not about me being right or you being right and us meeting at the middle. It's at us meeting at Jesus, you know, mm. and that completely changes mm -hmm. the, 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 the terrain because yeah. it's, we're not just trying to compromise between us and find a middle ground. Right. We're trying to aim for the ideal who is Christ. Mm -hmm. And without that ideal, like we're just, there's no way, like it can't. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Practical. No, go ahead, go ahead. 
Well, I was just going to build off of what you were saying, because it's like when you say you just make Jesus, and I like what you said, because then it, it makes it more tangible, which is the idea of meeting at Jesus and our difference is because there's a deference that we both bring to Jesus. So it's like, I can disagree with you and I can be passionate, but then the idea of what does this make me in the eyes of God and how I go about that disagreement, I cannot displease Jesus and how I handle this. Mm -hmm. And having that ultimate authority and that sort of you know, transcendent accountability that everybody submits to is what Jesus brings, not only as savior, but also as Lord. And we both submit to him to say, look, if Jesus says, you know, be angry, but sin not, or he says, you know, be kind one to another. Well, that's what Jesus says. So this is no longer about my opinion and my, my part of the issue. I have to ultimately engage with you according to Jesus's values. And that's what constrains me ultimately. Mm -hmm. And I think there, there are these, a whole lot of notions about, you know, unity and how do we achieve unity and et cetera. Um, the, the picture that I see in scripture is why, why God's people are united is because they're united in Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is, it's, it's, an, it's about your attitude. It's about even the values that you espouse. It's about the things that are, you know, what, not just being right, being righteous, like all of that is encapsula encapsulated in, in a submission to Christ, like right. you were saying. And so we can, Yes, it's true. I mean, it's absolutely true that they, there may be nicer people in the world who don't have Christ, um, but guaranteed the peace that the world offers is not a peace that can last. And so my takeaway is like, it's not the niceness, the factor, but it's the Jesusness, uh, the calibration that, that's, that's more important. Uh, I mean, this is my, my own words, but when there's two people and they're stuck in their subjective worlds, there's no peace. There's no, there's no conclusion you can get from the two subjectiveness. They just, right. but when they subject themselves to a third party, mm -hmm. then objectivity can come and the ob objectivity of God where both may be wrong, one may be right, or who knows what the situation is. Mm. And then the cool thing is that objectivity is not an objective, impersonal experience, it's a personal experience in Jesus. That's, that's, that's my parsing of, of our conversation here today. We need all of our relationships calibrated to Jesus. That's my prayer, so my, my marriage, my family, my friends, uh, <laughs> you guys, and all of the relationships they have, let's calibrate our lives back to Jesus based on the fellowship component of Christ's sacrifice for us. That's found in Leviticus chapter three. That's how we solve the world's problems today in this Bible study. <laughs> we'll, sur we'll solve more problems next week as we look at Leviticus chapter four. See you next week, guys. <laughs>